Okay, we will do that. Endoexo. <coughs> what else? Okay, um, let's start with then our third rule for Yale's Alders. Just to go back, rule number one. Rule number one was that we needed to have the alkene in the S cis conformation in order for the orbitals to overlap with the double bond, the spacing to be just right. The second rule was that whatever the stereochemistry was with the double bond, so for instance, in this case, if it's trans, then when I form the six-membered ring with the double bond there, that the CN groups in this specific, specific case would also be trans. So that's rule number two, that the stereochemistry in the double bond will get transferred over to the double bond when we add the groups together. And that's simply because when you have the diene, you have the four p orbitals of the diene system, you have the two orbitals of the alkene, and so as they come together, it's both bonds being formed at the same time. So there's no, let's add one bond, and then maybe the other one can rotate around. They have to add at the same time. Okay, so that was rule number two. Now rule number three happens when you have a cyclic diene. Okay, and when you have a cyclic diene, then we get this issue of endo and exo products, but only in one circumstance. So let's make a simple cyclic diene. So let's make this one, which is called cyclopentadiene. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to number my double bonds, my dienes, one, two, three, four, and then let's react that with just an alkene first with no, subs no substituents. So for five and six. So as, we build, so as we build this up, then our pair of electrons would move like this. Three, four would come out to form the four, six bond. And the 5-6 double bond would then be used to form the 1-5 single bond. So writing the product of this, there's two ways to write the product. The first way to write the product is to, again, write our six-membered ring with carbons 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And now what we can do is if we use our kind of rules here, we can say, okay, the double bond moved between carbons 2 and 3. What was attached to 1, 2, 3, and 4? Well, there was a CH2 group attached to both carbon 1 and carbon 4, so we could write it like this. That CH2 group is now attached to carbons 1 and 4 at the same time. So this is one way to write the product. And there are no groups on 5, 6, so I'm going to modify this a little bit when there are. But this is one way to write the product. And so this made a bicyclic system that I know in my class we talked about last semester because we had the brackets with the numbers that, on how to number this. Um, if I look at this from the standpoint of looking down this six-membered ring, it's going to look like this. The six-membered ring in this case is going to look like a boat conformation for a cyclohexane. And the reason that it, it goes into that boat, if we just look at it, is because the CH2 group that's attached is like that. So the CH2 is kind of pinning those two carbons up into what we would have called the, the, the boat conformation. And then our double bond between carbons two and three. So that would have been a bridge last semester. The CH2 would be the bridge. And so what we have is we have one, two, three, four, five. We have two five-membered rings that are pinned together. 
that are fused together. So that's what the that's what the basics of the final product <coughs> look like. And the other the other one that sometimes I'll use in the products or writing um, products is I will take and make it a six membered ring. So this is a cyclohexadiene. And again, if I react that with my double bond. I'm going to have my six, my six membered ring with the double bonds between carbon two and three, but now I'm going to have a CH2 attached to another CH2 attached there so that the ring system will look like that. And then on its side, it's going to again have a boat shaped six membered ring, but then it's going to have basically another it's going to have another two carbons so that it basically looks like this and again I have to make sure that I put my double bond in between carbons too. So this so this would be looking at this on its side. So now I have those two carbons. <coughs> I have two carbons all the way around. So from last semester that would be a two dot two dot two by cyclo system. So the question is what happens when there are groups on the double bond and that leads to the possibility of endo and exo but only only if the double bond is cis. So let's take the first case where Let's use the cyclopentadiene up here, and let's go ahead and do that, but let's do it with a trans alkene. And if you do this with a trans alkene, there is no rule. So if we take our cyclopentadiene with our CH2 group here, and we react it with a trans alkene, then we know that the stereochemistry must be preserved in that product. So just writing out the six-membered ring, the six-membered ring would have the double bond there. It would have a CH2 then as the bridge. But then the CN groups would be one would be bold and one would be dashed. And there's no rule for this. The stereochemistry of trans must be transferred over to the stereochemistry of trans in the product. So this is not endo or exo. When the two groups are trans, we do not have endo and exo. And so the stereochemistry that you add to the CH2, because what we're going to do here in a moment is I'm going to use bold wedges on the CH2 to indicate that it's above the ring, then we just write the product as we write the product. This is not endo and exo. Now, when the two groups on the double bond are cis, we have two possibilities. So let me just now if I have those two CN groups cis, I have two possible products. So if I write my six membered ring, double bond, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to write my CH2 to be on bold. So in other words, when I draw this, that means that the CH2 is going to be pointing at me above the plane. The two CN groups can be either also bold or they could be dashed. 
again, relative to the CH2, relative to the CH2 being, relative to the CH2 being bold, the CNs can, either, can also be bold or the CNs can also be dashed. And that is two different products. This one is called the exo product, and this was called the endo product. And I'll, we'll put them on their side so that it's clear uh, where the endo and exo terms come from. So we have two possible products, and the <coughs> issue is that when you do this reaction, you only get the endo product. You get 100% endo. Um, you get 0% exo. And there are there are rules for that, um, called Woodward Hoffman rules, um, for the two for the two people that. Um, basically won the Nobel Prize for, for coming up with this. It, it deals with what are called molecular orbitals and frontier molecular orbitals, and we're not going to go down that road. Um, I've sort of eliminated those chapters or those sections from the book, but they're there. Um, and it's not, I always thought it was, a for, I always thought it was forbidden to form the exo product, but then as I was modifying the diels alder reaction we did this week in lab, I found an experiment where they changed the conditions and they did actually get exo product. And I'm like, wait, I thought that was forbidden, but apparently it's not. It's just not preferred. So the endo product will be the major product because of the Woodward Hoffman rules. And Woodward was a famous synthetic chemist. Any picture you see of him, he has a cigarette in his hand because he smoked constantly, apparently. I have a picture in my office that allegedly was signed by him, probably with nicotine-stained fingers, but and the picture of him smoking, because that's what he did. Um, but he did synthesis of some natural products, like he didn't do Taxol, but anything that was important, they his group worked on synthesizing. And Rode Hoffman is a, he, he was a theoretical chemist at Cornell, He's actually been in Cleveland and given a talk. I couldn't go. I gave a couple of books I have of him to one of my colleagues who took them down, and I think he signed one for me. And then he signed the other one for her. They were my books to begin with, so I gave up possession of that book, which is the way that works. So endo is going to be the major product. So this is one way to write endo. Bold, bridge, dashed, groups. Well, what, is that, what does it look like? So if we look at our bicyclic system on its side, okay, the way that we actually define endo and exo is based on this plane. The endo and exo is based on the plane of those four carbons where the double bond is. Because in these systems, if you don't have the double bond, you're kind of lost. So the double bond is our marker of what four carbons came from the diene and then what two carbons came from the alkene. Because remember that the double bond always goes between carbons two and three. So those four are our, basically our point of reference here. So that if the bridge and the group, so now what I have is now I have axial and equatorial in this cyclohexane ring. Just that six-membered part would be a cyclohexane ring. I have equatorials and I have axial positions. If the two... Uh, I didn't want to use that color. Let's see what else I have? So if we have, so if we have the bridge and the two groups on the same side of this plane, 
then that is what is called exo. There's another, I think, more intuitive way of, of defining exo and endo, but technically this is how it's done. So what we say is, we say that if the bridge, and, and let me do this, because I think this probably makes more sense. I have a diagram in the, there is a diagram in the, uh, Let's just call the whole let's just call the whole six member ring the plane. So when the bridge and those two groups are basically cis, they're on the same side of the six member ring, that's exo. When the two groups are opposite, so let me just rewrite the bridge down here. And I know you're kind of like, wow, you can really just whip these things out. Remember, I've had a lot of practice. Or if you weren't saying that, if you've got that under control, then great. Okay. If the two groups are opposite the bridge in the six member ring plane, then that is called the endo product. So that's technically how they are defined as exo being same side of the ring, endo being opposite sides of the ring. So that's where the terminology comes from. Remember, the endo product is the, o, is the preferred product. So this is going to be the major product where the groups are opposite the bridge. But that's how we define endo and exo. Now, the way I like to think of it is this. I like to think of these molecules as basically having kind of a cylinder to them. So if I took the ring and the bridge, it would sort of be in a cylinder up and down. Can I do that without destroying this? So there's kind of the cylinder that I would draw with the bridge inside of the cylinder. And so then I go to biology and I say, what's an exoskeleton? It's outside. What's an endoskeleton? Inside. So where are these groups? If the groups are basically sort of aligned with the cylinder, then, or sorry, when they're aligned with the cylinder as they are down here, they're endo, they're inside. When they're pointing out of the cylinder, then they would be like exo. So that's, that's kind of the way I remember it. I don't remember the technical definition. I kind of just say, okay, here's a cylinder. Groups that are, that are equatorial that are pointing out are exo. Ones that are kind of in that cylinder are endo. So you can remember this either way. You can draw the product either way. Just make sure that whatever the bridge is, boulder dashed, the two products, when it is cis, and this is only when it's cis, those two products have to be dashed. So they have to be opposite to be endo. Does that help with that? Does that make sense? So that's whenever the whenever we have a cis alkene, as I showed you in the other problem here, um, when it's trans, there is no endo and exo product because having one group bold and one group dash doesn't have a name. So it's only when the two groups are the same, only when you react it with a cis alkene, do you get the endo or exo product, and we always get the endo product. So in terms of, like on Monday, if I give you one of these, which I will, on the quiz, I'm looking for the endo product as the major product. If you want to write both, then just say endo is the major product, because in this case, it would be the exclusive product. It's like 100 to 0.
Okay, does that kind of make sense? Um, so when we're writing Diels Alder prot reactions, if you're, you know, when you're starting out, if you do one, two, three, four on the double bonds, five and six, then that will help you figure out what groups are attached to what carbon in the product. I will also just add the following because I think in one of the lab sections you may have a whole series of Diels Alder products to do as part of your report. Um, that what happens when you have a triple bond, bless you, and what happens when you have a triple bond is that I'm still going to get a six-membered ring out of this. So I'm still going to get my one, two, three, four, five, and six. I'm still going to get those that six-membered ring. I'm going to get a double bond between carbons two and three. But now what happens as the electrons move around is that I leave a double bond between carbons five and six. So if you do a Diels Alder with an alkyne and the al and the diene, you end up with two double bonds, one between one and two, or between two and three, and one in between five and six. So that's the only difference of what happens when you have a triple bond. So other than that, it's just simply a question of trying to do those, right? trying to write the products. So let's take a look here at So the reaction that we used to do in lab was this one. We would instead of taking the butadiene sulfone that we used this week in lab and making butadiene out of it, what we did was we would tie back we would tie this into its um, double bond, into it, or sorry, into its cis S cis conformation, and we would then react it with maleic anhydride. So, how would you write the product of this reaction? How are we going to start? Okay. So now, what am I going to write? Well, how am I going to start the product out? I'm going to have my six membered ring, which I should probably at this point number one, two, three, four, five, and six. So if you're past that already, good for you. But if not, that's always a good place to start. Next, double bond between two and three. And so now there's a bridge between one and four. And I'll make it bold. You can make it dashed. But what do I have? I have a cyclic pro a cyclic diene with a cis alkene. So now I have to write the endo product. It's going to be the major product. So what's attached to five and six? The double bond with the O, the maleic anhydride part. So in this case, what wedge am I going to put here? Dashed wedge to the double bond to the O to another dashed to another dashed wedge. So the five and the six are kind of inconvenient here. So you can write the product like this. And that's the endo product because the wet, the bridge and the two groups are on opposite wedges. Why did you put the five and six up there? I because to get them away from being in the middle of the molecule. They should go there.
if I was to draw this on its side, it's going to look like this. You can draw that upside down. I never do. I always write it this way. And then where do the two, where do the two O groups go? Or the two C double bond O groups go? They're going down in the axials. So then you would have C double bond O to an O um, back to the C double bond O. Nope. Well, yes, sorry. Like that to form the five member bit. So this, we used to do this, we used to do this reaction in lab as a deals alder as opposed to with the butadiene sulfone. This one's a kind of a pain in, because cyclopentadiene is uh, a tad bit toxic. Um, but we used to use a small quantity of it. Back in the old days, in the old building, when they did it, the whole floor would, well, actually, it started out the whole building would smell like it, so everybody knew that's the experiment they were doing that week. Then it just was the floor. And then finally somebody said, you guys don't do that experiment anymore? And I'm like, no, we do. We just use a small quantity, and we do it in a hood. I guess what the old the old crotchety organic people I used to teach with was like, see, that's progress. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Let's not smell the entire building up with something that's sort of toxic, Maria. Did you have done the bold wedges out? Is that the dash ones or no? Could I have done the bold wedges? Yeah, I could I could write it. So you want to write it this way, like this. Like the ones out to the um, double bond to the oxygens. They have to, oh, they could be, if they were bold, this would have to be, if these were bold, these would have to be dashed. They have to be opposite. So in other words, I could do this. That's perfectly fine. But they have to be opposite wedges here. Any, uh, any questions? So I'll put some practice. I think I already put some practice problems on, but I'll put some more. No, I didn't put any practice problems on yet, but I will put some practice problems on doing these. And there's some in top hat. Now, these kinds of these kinds of bicyclic products that are made um, that kind of look like this. They look strange. They look strange last semester, but they are very common. If you went out and grabbed a couple of pine needles from whatever pine plants we have out here, pine trees, they would contain molecules. <coughs> I think one of the, something like that, if I start putting functional groups on it, would be approximately a camphor molecule. If the double bond is an OH, it's, it's a borneol. Those both have the smell. They give pine trees their pine smell. And plants are really good at putting <coughs> molecules together by Diels alders. Right? If you, if you had, for instance, an isoprene molecule, which is that. Isoprene, isoprene is kind of a building block for many of these molecules. So if, uh, in the plants, if I actually put together, I could take two isoprene units and have them react together to form a six-membered ring. So I could have uh, there here form the double bond there, or form the single bond there. So in other words, use one isoprene as a double bond, as a diene, 
and use the other isoprene as a single bond, what you can end up doing is forming a six-membered ring. And there's a couple of ways to do this. Um, I guess, unfortunately, the way I did it was this is where the numbering system comes in, to, comes in really handy. So the way I did it was one, two, three, four, five, and six. So we've got the double bond there, and then, wait, sorry, there is no double bond there. So if I took two of those isoprenes and put it together, this molecule is called limonene. And limonene is a flavoring, it's a fragrance, it's in every soda, it's in, um, it's kind of a limonene smell. The lime, the citrus, this is kind of the, the basics of a citrus smell. So you could say, what, what good are Deals Alders? Deals Alders plants make all their molecules with Deals Alders reactions. And so no matter anything that has a fragrance to it is going to have products in there that are from deals all the reactions. And there are things called terpenes that make up a good chunk of fragrance molecules. If you've ever heard of uh, turpentine they use to clean paintbrushes. It has basically the same structure as limonene. So there was a big kick for a while, like all the TV, late night TV infomercials, which I don't even know if they exist anymore. But they would be like, don't use turpentine because it smells horrible. Let's use orange peel oil because it smells orangey to clean your paintbrushes. Well, they're basically the same compound. They fall in that same category. So of course one smells better than another, but they do the same thing. So plants are really good at putting together deals all the reactions with these isoprene like units. So there is a there is organic chemistry that goes on in plants. Right? If you're in like bio two or three, like plants, who cares? I mean, they they do form some very interesting molecules. Okay. So these, so these kinds of molecules are, these kinds of molecules are used. One other, one other thing with these is that this carbon right here is called the bridgehead carbon. And the bridgehead carbon, if you put a leaving group on there, that, this is a tertiary carbon. And if I put like a bromine or a chlorine on there, you'd think, oh, well, I can just have that halogen leave and form a carbocation. No. When people started proposing the idea of carbocations being trigonal planar, the next step was, does it have to form a trigonal planar geometry? And so people went about synthesizing these molecules with a leaving group here, and they won't leave. Because the carbocation must be trigonal planar, and is it in this bridgehead? It's not. It can't be. And so if you actually try and remove that chlorine or bromine with maybe like a silver ion would come in and it would precipitate, you don't get the you don't get the carbocation there. You actually get a hydrogen shift over, and the carbocation forms at one of these two positions. So that was some classical work that was done in the well, probably in the 60s to de to determine okay does a carbocation have to be trigonal planar? And the answer in these systems was yes. You can't form a carbocation at that. That's called Brett's rule. And my PhD advisor was doing, he, we did calorimetry to measure the heats 
of the reaction to try and see if a reaction would occur or not. <laughs> And I remember finding one of these compounds from a guy who will eventually win the Nobel Prize in the lab in an old bottle and pulled it out. I'm like, what's this? And it was one of these compounds. But the note on the inside said, you know, hey, Ned, this is, you know, when you're done with this, can you send it back? Because this is like the world supply of that. And the date was like 1969 from somebody in, in Princeton who's now at Georgia, but went to Europe. And, and I, I said, um, I found this. And he goes, wow, it's kind of late to send that back. I should have kept the letter because the guy, it was a personal note to him. But those kinds of compounds were studied all the time. Well, we know now there's a lot of work that went into that. So you may not find it very fascinating, but there is, when we say it has to be trigonal planar, there is, that was probably years of work to just confirm that fact. So that's where you see them as well. But if you, these kinds of bicyclic compounds are in everything. Anything that's plant related, you're gonna, and they're going to be stranger than that. They're going to be, you know, seven membered rings with a three with a three membered ring across the top of them. So, okay. All right. Last thing. And that is, in the textbook, they talk about they talk about the issue of substituents having effects on the rate of reaction. So just so I get this right, pull up the book, and because I don't normally go into this, but you will this time. So. The prototypical reaction given in, between butadiene and, eth and ethylene. That's what we did yesterday, basically. The butadiene is the one that we've been using with no substituents. Ethylene would just be the two carbon chain. That reaction only occurs at elevated temperature and gives poor yields. <clears throat> so if you want to make a deals alder reaction go faster, you must use a combination of diene and alkene. And the optimum combination is that the diene is electron rich and the dienyl file, which is the uh, alkene, is electron poor. So the electron rich diene reacting with the electron poor double bond. So this should be electron poor, this should be electron rich. Okay. That's the optimum combination. Now this gives us the opportunity, which we will con which we will talk about as well on Monday, to start talking about okay, how do you make a molecule electron rich? And the way you're going to make the molecule electron rich is you're going to put electron donating groups onto the alkene, or onto the diene. And then you're going to put electron withdrawing groups onto the alkene. And the electron donating and electron withdrawing groups are critical in the next chapter when we start talking about reactions of benzene rings because we're going to have a whole list of electron donating groups a whole list of electron withdrawing groups that you'll have to learn slash memorize and then you'll also have to know the order in which like what's the best electron donating group what's the best electron withdrawing group so we we will talk about that but this is a good place to kind of introduce that topic and the reason for the reason for electron rich and electron poor is beyond the scope of this course. It all has to do with molecular orbital theory, and it has to do with what are called highest occupied molecular orbitals and lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals, homo lumo theory, which again I'm going to say is beyond the scope of this course. But it is it is ultimately the theoretical basis on which 
things have color, um, and how these reactions will occur. So we're going to need to talk about, okay, how do you push electron density into the ring, or how do you push electron and double bond into the diene and the alkene, and we will do that on We'll do that on Monday along with talking about the introduction, introductory stuff of benzene. Okay. So the reading assignment for Monday is in the, in the folder. I updated the folder. We will also talk about aromaticity on Monday. The quiz will be Deals Alder reactions. And so I'll give you a couple Deals Alder reactions for you to write the products of. So I will I'll try and put some extra practice problems online as well. All right, if you have any questions, throw them up on Piazza, email me, otherwise I'll see you on